everyone, and welcome back to Amplify Agile. I'm Kiara Zapanta, and in today's episode, we're going to discuss the updated Scaled Agile Framework. Um, today is joining me is Dr. Steve Maynard, the VP of Framework, Methodologist, and SAFE Fellow with Scaled Agile. Um, and he'll share his insights on the key updates of SAFE 6.0. Um, so Steve, if you can please give us a quick introduction of yourself and background. Sure. Thanks for the invitation. So glad to be here and uh, looking forward to our time together. Uh, as you said, my name is Dr. Steve Maynard. I work with the Framework team. That's the group inside of Scaled Agile that does all of the research and the writing that advances the guidance in the framework and turns up in new versions like Save 6.0 that you're, you're all seeing now. As far as my background, I've been in the technology business uh, over 35 years uh, in both commercial and in government industries. And I've been with Scaled Agile for just under eight years. So delighted to be here. Awesome. Thank you. We're happy to have you here. So just diving into the first topic that I'd like to discuss, which is the key updates and enhancements to the framework. So can you give our listeners a brief overview of the key updates and enhancements that were introduced in Safe 6.0? And um, how, 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 how do they address the changing landscape of Scaled Agile? Sure, absolutely. So there are definitely some key themes that you'll see when you explore Safe 6.0. By far, the, the biggest headline and the thing that's really got so many of our customers buzzing is all the deeper guidance around how do we really accelerate the flow of value to customers. All of our customer industry uh, organizations, are they all provide build amazing products and services, and they want to get those services and those products into the hands of their customers uh, as, as quickly and as smoothly as they can, but that's still such a big struggle for so many organizations. And so feeling that feedback and that, that pain still out there, we really put a ton of effort into really understanding what the, what the challenge was. Why is it still a struggle, even though we've written about flow uh, since the very early days of SAFE? So uh, you'll find a, a tremendous amount of a guidance in there around, around that topic, and it really seems to be resonating. Beyond that, uh, we also uh, heard from our customers that people really want to understand their role in working in a safe organization and how to do that role effectively. And of course, we have had uh, role-based articles that provided guidance on those roles for a very long time. But when we went back in and looked at them, honestly, we haven't we hadn't touched them for the last several versions because honestly, there hasn't been a lot of evolution of those roles. But what we found when we went back in and looked at the articles with fresh eyes is they were kind of hard to read and and they provided this list of you know 20, 30 different responsibilities that a role might have. And we could certainly understand how that might be a little difficult for, for people to get their arms around. And so we rewrote all of those articles and we instituted something we call the responsibility wheel, basically boiling down the responsibilities into typically five, sometimes six major groupings, major areas of responsibility that each of the roles has. And we have found those visualizations have, have just really helped unlock and unblock people on getting their minds around what is it I'm supposed to do if I'm a scrum master team coach or if I'm a product owner or if I'm an RTE. So that's probably the second biggest thing. A couple of other things, we we took some guidance that we had been working on for a while around artificial intelligence and big data and cloud. And we moved those from extended guidance articles kind of in the background into primary articles right on the front of the big picture. We're doing a lot of work in artificial intelligence and in, in AI because it is a hot topic, as you can imagine, with the explosion of chat GPT in November of last year. Everybody's now asking, you know, what are we doing in our organization about? It? We're happy that we got ahead of that and, and provided some, some guidance that explains it a little bit, but also helps our customers understand how does practicing safe actually help you in reasoning through what your AI strategy is going to be. And so we talk about that in the articles. And then I guess the last thing would be, we know that particularly leaders, executives really want to understand what are the what are the outcomes they're getting from this, this better way of working, that you know, all the investment that they've 
made in safe? How how do can we measure ourselves? And so we fully embraced uh, OKRs and integrated them into uh, into the the metrics framework inside of Safe. We know so many organizations have adopted OKRs, and so we wanted to answer the question: How does that work with Safe? And we also uh, enhanced uh, the measure and grow the metrics guidance. We included flow metrics, so you can actually measure if you have flow. So all of the measurement and outcomes conversation we felt was still a big pressing need inside of our customers. So those are really the big things, the big themes that you'll find. Uh, we also, in addition to the role articles, we just went through literally every single article in the framework and, and just asked ourselves, is this, is this reading well? Can people understand this? And we actually used, uh, we used Grammarly, if you're familiar with that tool, which is an AI powered mm -hmm. tool. We actually used AI to evaluate our writing to say, you know, are we are we writing with clarity and 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 simplicity and for understanding at a certain reading level? And uh, Grammarly, you know, is uh, was uh, was pretty brutal, but but it was great because we really feel like the articles are are at a at a much better level throughout uh, the system. And you'll you'll see cleaner graphics and new branding and. It's a very visually different uh, kind of experience as you go through the framework as well. So that's, that's the awesome. high level fast overview of what you want. <laughs> that's awesome that you guys use Grammarly to check your, your writing and grammar and all that stuff. That's awesome. So I want to dive deep into the key themes that you mentioned. So the first one, I know you play Safe 6 Auto places emphasis on the theme, accelerating value flow, like you mentioned. Um, are you able to provide a quick overview of the key principles behind accelerating value flow within this framework? Absolutely. So uh, as many that have been with us on this journey and safe for a while certainly should know, we've, we've always talked about the importance of flow. In fact, if you went to the safe principles, principle six, we talked about flow and how you achieve flow in, in that principle. And there are other things throughout the framework that really, really supported and enabled flow. But we just couldn't get past the fact that in spite of all of that guidance, our customers were still struggling. It was one of the biggest things we heard in our voice of customer conversations, the opportunities we had to, to go out in Gimba and really see firsthand how, the, how safe is being adopted. And so we really kind of took a step back as a team and said, why is this happening and what can we do better? So uh, Dean has a saying that he he often uses about going back to first principles, like go back to the beginning and, and understand where is our guidance coming from and is there more that we could harvest to help our customers? And in that process, we went back to a book that's been around for, for quite some time called Lean Thinking by Womack and Jones. We've had that reference in the framework for a while, but we we went back through it uh, as well as some other resources. And, and what, what we found was that although we had talked about three important things to do to facilitate flow, as we went deeper into the literature and in the conversations we had with customers, we found that unlocking flow is, is more than just those, those three elements. In fact, we did, we are pretty confident now that there's at least eight, there may be more, but there's eight that we wrote about that. So that would be five new in addition to the three we'd already written about that are, are the elements of flow. Like what are the, what are the elements of a flow based system? What are the properties? So if you look at any, any flow based system, what would you look for? What are the properties? We had talked about three. Uh, which would have been small batches, limiting working process, and, and short queuings. But we found that, that there's more to the story than that. And so the first thing we did is we added to our description of what those properties were. So you now have eight different properties, any of which can either facilitate or block flow. And some are, are ones that people might not have thought about. Things like having our our workers have time and zone, uninterrupted focus time. Just think about your own workday and how you flow through the, you know, in terms of your delivery of value and how difficult that is if you're constantly being interrupted from minute to minute and how much time it takes you to get back into, into that zone where you're really, you know, solving difficult problems. 
So that's something that that we and others had never really written about in this conversation of flow. And so we added that as, as an example. Now, with each of those properties, then, we had to provide guidance that would say, okay, if you find through the flow metrics, for example, that one of these properties is the is the cause of delay in getting value out the door, what do you do about it? What's our recommendation for how to solve that? And so we called those the eight accelerators. How do you accelerate past the 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 barrier and cause flow to you know to to uh, continue as you want it to? So we wrote all of that guidance in a completely rewritten uh, principle six article that will describe in depth what each of the eight properties are. And then at a high level, what are the strategies to overcome barriers at each one of those eight properties if you're if you're experiencing a delay in flow with any one of them? Perfect. Um, I do recommend our audience, if you do want to check out that article, to check out the Scaled Agile Framework website to dive more in depth with that. Um, so I did like that you mentioned that it was really driven by the struggles that customers were having in achieving the fast value flow and the new flow articles, such as like team flow, art, art flow, solution train flow, and portfolio flow. They describe the application of the eight um, flow ac accelerators that you mentioned at different levels of the SAFE framework. Um, I'm curious to know how leveraging these flow accelerators um, really address the issues with continuous value flow and contribute to a more streamlined and efficient value delivery process? Great question. So if you look at principle six, it's really going to outline sort of the, the basic definitions and the constructs of what a flow-based system involves in the accelerators. But if you look at SAFE, SAFE is, is a collection of patterns for achieving business agility that spans the organization from the individual team all the way up to portfolio level practices and even enterprise portfolios where you're really looking at how you are accomplishing the strategy of an entire enterprise through the development of your products and solutions. So as you could imagine, at those different levels of scale, the implementation patterns for how you, how you implement the flow accelerators are going to look very different. How you how you manage work in process, for example, for a team is going to look very different than how you do that for a portfolio. So we recognized that we couldn't just stop at the principle six article. We needed to provide detailed how to guidance. How do you implement each of those eight accelerators, but how do you do it at the level of scale that you're focused on? So that's why there are four separate flow articles. And those articles are written in, in the, the specific language of how to, right? The principle is, is more of the what. The flow articles are the how. How do you implement these things in a practical sense at, at each of those uh, each of those four levels? So that's that was our you know our focus is we wanted to go beyond just you know just the theory and really give people the the practical tips that they can go out and apply immediately perfect yeah that's awesome that the tips really do provide some guidance to the teams or every level that is trying to implement it um so what about value stream management how does vsm contribute to achieving the continuous flow of value delivery and safe 6.0 um, and how is VSM applied to principles of lean thinking to establish a culture of flow in an org? So the concept of value streams has has been around for a while. So when you think about flow right, mm -hmm. as, a, as a topic, so what is flowing? Well, we want value to flow, whatever the value it is that you are providing to your market. Uh, whether that's uh, you know a new automobile, if you're in the automobile industry, or whether that's a new financial product if you're in the banking industry, right? So that's the value, and you want to get that value out the door. Well, to do that, it requires a series of steps to go from the idea, hey, we think we could really provide value to customers if we did X, if we added this feature. But then you've got to go through all the steps that it takes to actually evaluate, design, build, test, deploy, release, 
uh, operate, monitor that capability in the market. That whole series of activities is what we call a value stream. It's all the work, all the people, all the information, all the materials that it takes to deliver value. Now, there's, there's still a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of misunderstanding or, or mystery even around what is a value stream, because value streams, if you look at, at a traditional org chart, are very hard to see. They're hard to conceptualize. And even if you manage to, maybe you're using a, a partner, an SPC, uh, someone that coaches you through how to identify your value streams, just identifying them isn't enough. You actually have to implement them and you have to operate them on, on a day in, day out basis. You have to decide as new initiatives are formed, how does that, uh, how does that get into a value stream? Which value stream should address it? Uh, how do you how do you deal with dependencies? How do you do with deal with coordination between multiple value streams if you're building something really, really big? Those are all the challenges that that value stream management is designed to address. It's not just what are they, but once you instantiate them, how do you make sure that that they are effectively managed and monitored and that things are actually flowing through that value stream? And the other thing that, that you're going to find if you work with value streams in your organization, uh, that value streams aren't static. You can't define them once and then walk away and they're gonna work forever because the environments our organizations operate in are not static. They're very dynamic and things change quickly. And so we also have to be able to not just organize around value, but then to reorganize around value when circumstances change and our value streams need to look different. All of that is the responsibility of value stream management. And, and the, the term, which is broadly adopted in, in many industries and you know many different thought leaders around the world, the thing to keep in mind for, for anyone listening to this that's not as familiar with value streams or value stream management is we're not talking about heavy top-down command and control kind of, of management here. This is in the context of lean thinking and, and working in a lean context that value stream management operates in. So it's, it's a new set of skills that many of our leaders in our organizations may not be familiar with. They didn't come from a background that taught them how to think about organizing the workforce and organizing the work in this way. And so our guidance on value stream management will really help them learn what that means and what their role is in that process. Perfect. That's awesome. So now that we've covered accelerating value flow, I want to transition into the next theme that you covered, which is the responsibility wheel or empowering teams and clarifying responsibilities. Um, so how would you say does this theme contribute to the overall success of an agile organization? Um, and what are really the key benefits of giving uh, more autonomy to teams? I think this is what really motivates a lot of us who work at, at Scaled Agile. I know on the framework team, uh, we're constantly reminding ourselves and reminding others that, you know, there's a there's a lot that goes on into adopting safe to, to running any kind of organization. But at the end of the day, it's really all about people. People do all the work. People are the organization people receive the value of whatever it is that we we create. It's one of the reasons why we elevated respect for people as one of the core values in SAFE in 6.0. So when we were looking at the people lens of, of the new version of, of SAFE, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing that we did is went into all of the articles that are designed for individual roles, for people who are performing roles, and just asked ourselves, are we doing them, uh, you know, the, are we providing them the best value that we possibly can? Are we really providing the clarity they're looking for? And as we, you know, put a self-critical lens on to the articles we had in place before, we had to say, no, that's that's really not great. Um, it it might have been okay at the time, but we can do better than that. And that's what led us to, uh, you know, to applying Grammarly, looking at our writing, coming up with the responsibility wheel, the way to simplify and make it easier for people to not just read about, but also have a visual, a graphical visual that they can, you know, they can remember as they're executing their role that 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 this is, these are the main things that I need to be focused on if I'm serving in any of these 
uh, in, in any of these roles. So it's a lot easier to remember four or five, six things uh, and, uh, you know, and and then be able to go into the article and pull the details underneath those five or six things when you need it. But as you're as you're moving around, executing your role on a daily basis, just keeping, you know, that short list in, in your head is, a, is certainly a, a lot easier. Now, as far as this, you know, uh, decentralized decision making and, and giving more autonomy to the teams, that's also an important aspect of respecting people, right? Respecting the the talent, the skills, the knowledge, the expertise that each person brings to the organization. And that that really gives them the ability to effectively make appropriate decisions at, at the appropriate level, much more so than many organizations have practiced in the past. So this, we felt, was also an important concept for us to revisit. Uh, and, and as we revisited, we made the decision to completely rewrite that article as well. So that's another principle inside of the SAFE 10 principles that we gave a complete remodel to is this idea of decentralized decision making? Uh, we we made a we made kind of a big announcement on that recently at the Safe Summit in Nashville, and that was a, a keynote presentation that was given by our chief methodologists Dean Leffingwell and and Andy Sales uh, at the summit, really walking everybody through, you know, the the much much deeper conversation on what does it mean to decentralize decision making and how do leaders actually implement that what should it look like? How, what are the precursors? You know, you can't just, a leader can't just say, okay, I'm gonna practice decentralized decision-making, it's your decision, good luck, right? That's not, a, that's not effective leadership, that's not preparing people and equipping people to make sure they have what they need to effectively take on those decisions, right? So there's 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 things leaders have to do to create that environment, and so we wrote about that, we updated that guidance, uh, and and honestly, it's again, it's one of those areas of the the new version of Safe that's getting overwhelmingly positive response. That's awesome. Um, can you provide some examples of the role articles that have been updated to illustrate these improvements? Perhaps the Scrum Master role or Scrum Teams or any of those examples that you can share that were updated. Yeah, so it's it's funny that you should mention um, the Scrum Master article because that's one of the big changes that that we made is we actually changed the name of the role from Scrum Master to Scrum Master Team Coach. There's a couple of reasons behind that. Uh, the first one is we're finding more and more that in our customer organizations, teams are electing to use either a combination of, of Scrum and Kanban and, and some other team level practices. Some are going pure Kanban and, and really kind of moving away from, from the, the labels and the, and the events inside of Scrum. And so having a role on the team that was only reflective of, of a single uh, team-based model was causing some, uh, I guess, unhappiness amongst our customer base that we're using some different patterns. I think it also reflects the deeper responsibilities that we need out of that role than maybe what the Scrum body of knowledge talks about. So things like uh, coaching flow. So we made that a prime responsibility of a Scrum Master who on the team needs to really understand these eight properties, the eight accelerators, the how-to guidance at the team flow level the flow metrics and, and how do we capture those metrics and what's important for us to, to, to include in the updates to our, our lifecycle management tool, whatever it might be, so that we have those metrics. Well, obviously that, that makes total sense that that's something that a Scrum Master team coach would deepen their expertise on so that they could coach the team in those practices. Our previous article knew nothing about that. Right. So so we had to provide that deeper guidance to say, look, you're the ex you're the expert. This is the value you're providing to the team. So, uh, you know, so be prepared to to provide that coaching. Uh, be prepared to understand what it takes 
for a team to be a high performing team. So now we're getting into some team dynamic kinds of things and conflict resolution and and, and, and how do you, you know, how do you, you know, get teams to that truly high performing level? Some of it's about flow, right? Teams that are in high flow are typically high performing teams, but there are other things as well. So, I mean, that's just one example. As you, as you look at the articles, you're going to find that, yes, some of it's simply uh, a consolidation and simplification of the role and the creation of that visual graphic. And in some cases, we just we just went a lot deeper with Scrum Master Team Coach being the obvious, most observable change. But I'd say there was there's some amount of that treatment in the, all the other role articles as well. Perfect. <laughs> if our audience wants to take a look at those detailed guidance, um, do check out the Scaled Agile website and they'll have it all detailed out in depth there. Um, so transitioning into the next big theme of AI, big data and cloud. Um, I know this was introduced in the new Safe 6.0. Um, I wanted to see if you can elaborate on how the incorporation of these um, within this within Safe can help organizations make informed decision decisions, also optimize processes, and drive continuous improvement at all levels. You bet. So it's interesting. We began the journey of exploring this topic at the very beginning of 2021. So while we were still in the middle of COVID. Uh, and it really began with a conversation that Dean had with our team one day as he was watching kind of what was going on in the private equity markets and in the venture capital markets. Uh, he's he's kind of a, a, a hobby. It's a hobby of his uh, to as an entrepreneur to pay attention to those things. And what he was seeing was that there was this massive shift of capital that was starting to move into these AI focused initiatives and startup companies. And it was unusual enough from the, from the past years, these goes, no, something's going on here. Why is, why is all this money moving in such large amounts all of a sudden? And so it's, it's like you start pulling the thread on the sweater and it just, you know, everything becomes clearer and, we we knew enough to know that something was happening, but we weren't quite sure what it is. So we had to learn. So that's what we did first is we had to educate ourselves. So we did a lot of things. We read tons of books. We read tons of articles. The whole team actually took an entire class on AI at Oxford University, uh, not Oxford, Mississippi, like Oxford, England. Uh, <laughs> We, because we just need to learn, right? We needed to, we needed to absorb and really figure out. So why is this such a big deal? Because AI is for anybody that knows AI at all. AI has been around for decades. I mean, it originates back in the 1940s. Uh, so now, why all of a sudden is this is this suddenly a big deal? So, long story short, what we uncovered was that there was a convergence of advancements in technology that were starting to enable AI to have a real impact that it was not having in the past because those supporting technologies weren't there. And those supporting technologies, of course, are big data. So we had to have enough massive data for an algorithm to, to process through so that it could do what the algorithm was designed to do. Well, if you think about historical technologies and the state of data, it just wasn't producing data at the at the mass quantity that the algorithms needed. But now with the explosion of data that I think we should all be familiar with, right? It's all about the data now. Now all of a sudden, that that massive amount of data is there. So that was the first precursor. The second precursor is you have to have the massive processing power that the alg so you got the data you got the logic inside the algorithm but if you don't have the processing power that can really grind through all that data and do what the what the ai technologies are designed to do then you still don't have that that nexus of capabilities right well of course now we understand with all of the with cloud computing with the advancements in processors and and the processing power of gpus uh that now all of a sudden that processing power is there. So it really was a perfect storm convergence of the the AI technology, the data and the processing power that has that was coming together 
you know, in in this moment in time. Now, we still at that time in 2021, we knew something big was coming. We didn't know what and we didn't know when. But we were convinced through all of our research that unlike some of the other leading edge technologies, which might or might not impact an industry. So not every industry is going to be affected by autonomous vehicles, for example. So transportation, logistics, yes, but banking, mm, maybe not, right? AI was something that we thought it didn't matter what industry it is. It doesn't matter if you're commercial or government. This was going to impact everybody. And if it's going to impact every single organization, that made us feel like we as Skilled Agile need to say something about it. We needed to raise the flag. We need to say, hey, you need to pay attention to this. And here are some basic things that you should know. If you don't know these things, you need to you need to get familiar because it's coming. Right. So we wrote those articles. We felt pretty good. We thought they were pretty well written and it covered the, you know, covered the bases. We had no idea as we were preparing to release 6.0 that in November of last year, ChatGPT would put AI in everyone's conversation, not just business people, but literally kitchen table conversations in homes around the globe. Because what ChatGPT did, GPT did is it, it made it accessible to the average human being, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, and and it 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 literally exploded into our consciousness as as a global society. So we feel kind of good that we got ahead of it. <laughs> and we said, we told you it was coming. We didn't know it was this, and we didn't know it was this this month. But but now we think it's important to follow that up with um, deeper guidance, right? It was a good first start, but we're we're continuing the research. We're continuing to talk to customers. In fact, we're right in the middle of a of a of a deep research effort right now. And uh, in fact, this morning we just reviewed the results of our most recent survey of of customers. And and as expected, this is this is on the top of everybody's mind. And there are there are definitely critical challenges that they're facing. Everybody's playing with ChatGPT. Everybody's, you know, just exploring and what, you know, what can I do? And that's cool. That's great. But at some point, that has to turn into real business differentiating capability that helps you achieve better success in whatever market it is you're working in, which means it has to scale. It means it has to be, you know, reliable, dependable, right? All of the illities. It has to be secure. Uh, we have to manage the risk. I mean, this is a this is a strange behaving technology that a lot of people don't know how, you know, how do we manage this? How do we keep it from hallucinating? How do we secure our data so it's not leaking our data out to the world? I mean, there's all of these issues that that customers weren't thinking about necessarily, you know, a year, two years, three years ago, but they're definitely thinking about it now. So we're gonna we're going to continue on this quest to find the information that we think our customers uh, need the most right now based on where they are in the adoption process, uh, to find the best practices, the organizations that are at the front end of the development of this technology and what patterns they've used to overcome some of these challenges of scaling and operationalization and security and legal and ethics and provide that guidance like we always do out to our global customers. So hopefully we can help them along that that journey figure out how do they how do they gain the value of the technology without running into a lot of the landmines that are also accompany the technology that's awesome i'm looking forward to your updated um research within ai within safe um so additionally how can organizations leverage the synergies offered by safe six auto to not only drive innovation and value but also ensure that they can swiftly adapt to technological um technology advancements and evolving customer expectations yeah so the the good news here is that the success patterns for leveraging ai uh, they are they are emerging and they are maturing at warp speed compared to past new technologies if you think about when you know when sql came out or when the internet came out or you know pick pick any past technological revolution think about the time that it took for that technology to really mature and and for businesses to really understand how to leverage them 
AI is working completely differently. Yes, it's been around for a long time, but it's past this Cambrian moment. So now the, the new advancements, the new ways of, hey, this is working, uh, even making a lot of these capabilities off the shelf, so you don't have to invent them as a company. You can, you can contract with Microsoft or you can contract with, you know, pick the big tech company and they can provide you these capabilities literally off the shelf, just as part of your AWS subscription or your Azure subscription or whatever the case may be. So what that means is, is uh, companies can start leveraging these AI powered capabilities immediately or with very minimal customer uh, uh, custom development to gain the advantage of what this technology is bringing. Uh, you know, just one example uh, is uh, many developers now are familiar with tools like Copilot. So using AI to give recommendations on how to write a new piece of code or maybe to look at existing code and find defects or find technical debt, find more efficient ways to write that code. That's a capability that's there today. And companies don't have to invent it. They just have to give their developers access to the tool and they are immediately, they're using AI, right? To improve their, their business operations. So, you know, we're finding more and more of those uh, examples that are starting to appear that will help scrum masters and team coaches that will help uh, product managers. There's a lot happening in the product management space to help better understand markets, better understand customers, better understand the competitive environment. And again, these are with off-the-shelf tools that have been developed, powered by AI. That all you need to do is learn how to use the tool and give it to the give the data to it, and you'll get the advantage of these capabilities. So that's what we're seeing most immediately that companies are are able to do as they learn and figure out what are the more advanced uh, AI capabilities that might emerge that they want to leverage. Okay, perfect. Um, so I know that Safe 6.0 aims to be more adaptable to different industries beyond just software development. Um, I want to know if you can share some examples of how Safe 6.0 has been successfully applied in non-traditional domains. Uh, you bet. Uh, this is Probably wasn't one of the main themes, but it's it was something that we wanted to start moving deeper into because, again, in the conversations we have with customers, we are uncovering that, especially customers that had been using, say, for instance, in IT or in their development uh, part of the organization, seeing the benefits that those parts of the organization were gaining not just in terms of faster development, but in, in things like employee engagement and, and even customer satisfaction with the products that were being produced as compared to before they tried to use an agile way of working. So it started to get the attention of other parts of the organization, uh, marketing, uh, human resources, um, uh, finance, legal even. And so it, through these these conversations that that we were and, and comments that we were hearing from customers, uh, we we did some research uh, and you know we found that they were already out there innovating. They weren't waiting for us. They were just taking what they had learned from their their IT organization, for example, and they were just applying it already inside of these these non IT parts of the organization. Uh, and now we've had some guidance around that in the organizational agility competency article, but we were just getting more and more patterns that were well beyond what, what that article includes. So what we did in 6.0 is we, we took advantage of uh, just a small label down in the lower left-hand corner of the big picture car called business and technology. And we, we completely rewrote the article that was behind that label. And what you'll find there now is a set of five very specific patterns that we've observed in the field more than once or twice. We, we've seen it enough where we felt comfortable saying these are actual patterns that, that organizations that wanted to leverage what they were seeing in, in safe usage in technology and apply it throughout the rest of the organization. And so we, we spent enough time with those customers to understand those patterns, and we wrote about those patterns. And so it's just the beginning. We're, we're, we're still 
we're still out there observing you know, is are, are these the only five are there more uh what additional guidance would customers need if they wanted to try to implement some of these patterns so that's what we're doing now is continuing that research and there will be you know much like with ai there's going to be more guidance as we learn more that will help organizations implement those patterns uh, if they think that's going to help their their company as well perfect um so and for organizations that are already familiar with earlier versions of safe um, what are the key considerations and benefits of transitioning to the new version of SAFE? Um, how can they approach this transition effectively? Great question. So certainly we believe, as we've talked about in the conversation so far, that there are there are many benefits and 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 pieces of value, new guidance, better guidance that we've included in 6.0. So we hope that that value proposition speaks for itself and people, once they get exposed to it, will just want to take advantage of not just what's in the articles, but also what's in all of the supporting guidance and the and the practice assets and, and things that we put inside of Safe Studio that go along with the framework that, that help organizations adopt those practices. That being said, if if you're still using version five and you're very, uh, you know, you're kind of, um, you know, still at that level and, and not ready to jump to 6.0 yet, the good news is there, while we may have made things better uh, and and more, more clearly written and some different graphical treatments and so forth, the core of what SAFE is and what we wrote about is, is still there. And so they're very compatible. Organizations aren't going to have to worry, you know, too much about, um, you know, am I incompatible with 6.0 guidance? Absolutely not. Just go to 6.0. It's free. Everybody can get to it and just find those areas that, that you can take advantage of, even if you haven't uh, necessarily upgraded your entire workforce or had people do their, their upgrade to, to get to 6.0 and to, you know, to apply those across the organization. Now, the good news is also that, that, upgrade is we made much easier for folks than we have in versions past. So there's a very simple upgrade process. You're able to get through it right through Studio. Uh, uh, we've had tremendous positive feedback about the, the complete change that we made to how people can upgrade from a five-level certification to, a, to six uh, and understand what the differences are relevant to, to their role. So, um, and I just, I highly recommend it's if, if you're concerned about doing an upgrade because of what you might've experienced in the past, you know, it was, it was too long. We had to take a test. There's just all these, uh, give it a try. You, you may be delightfully surprised that what we provided you is effective in helping explain what the differences are, but not such a high wall to climb that it really demotivates you from trying to do the upgrade. Uh, and and then everybody will get uh, you know get upgraded and they'll want to do the the new guidance in 6.0. Perfect. Okay. And my last question: Where do you think a software solution or tool like Aptio Target Process can help in enabling and implementing Safe 6.0? Yeah. So we love our our tooling partners, our technology partners, uh, and and there's been obviously tremendous value that that. Uh, you and and other other companies in this space have provided to all of our customers over the years. But what I can tell you is that as of 6.0, for many reasons, having effective tools to support your implementation, I mean, it's just not optional anymore. Uh, I mean, believe me, I grew up in in the early, early days of agile dating all the way back into the 1990s before the manifesto and 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 literally grew up learning uh, from you know organizations like scrum alliance and others you know we're going to adopt agile so we're all going to take a bunch of stickies and you know we're going to write on them and put them on the board and move them around there's something very satisfying about that that uh, that kinetic action which is great when you're learning but the reality is we need the data if, if you are not using a, a tool like, like Aptio Target Process, I'm very familiar with, uh, getting to those flow metrics 
really understanding where you've got a bottleneck or or where you need to focus attention if if you don't have the tooling to go with it to support it it's next to impossible so if you really want flow if you want to take advantage of the flow guidance if you want to understand the flow metrics and apply them at all those different levels and and understand is value flowing or do we have a bottleneck somewhere? And if we've got a bottleneck, where is it? How do we find it? How do we fix it? You just can't do that without, without tools like Target Process. So we're so grateful we've got a community of, of partners that are providing those services because it would really be next to impossible to implement our guidance without it in any kind of reasonable, effective way. Completely agree. Um, so that's all the topics that we have today, folks. A huge thank you to Dr. Steve Maynard for joining us today and sharing his valuable insights. Um, it was amazing having you on today, and I can't can't wait to have you back in the future. Um, everyone, please feel free to leave any questions or comments in the comment section below and stay tuned for our next episode.